God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord, right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. K98 Talk is expanding its lineup for 2015. This means we are expanding our advertising base. Whether you're a startup trying to push through to the next level or an established business trying to supplement your advertising budget, web-based advertising is a solid investment. Thanks to Talk's newest partnership with TuneIn Radio and instant access to our sister station, K98 FM, we give you worldwide access at a reasonable cost. Interested parties should email us at advertise at k98talk.org. K98talk.com, a leader in Internet radio. So grab your seatbelts and take the ride of your life on k 98 Talk. Com. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. For past programs of God's Pure Word of Faith, go to www.spreaker.com. That's Spreaker. S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R dot com. In a search box at the top of the page, enter my name, Richard Harden, H-A-R-D-I-N, and click on it. A picture with a cross and God's pure word of faith, Richard Harden, will show up. Click on the picture of the cross. A listing of all the past programs will then show up. You're listening to God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden. Richard will guide you through the Bible and help you find God's purpose for your life. Now here's teacher and author Richard Harden. Welcome to God's Pure Word of Faith. I'm Richard Harden. Again, I thank the Lord and the management of K98 Talk for this great opportunity to share God's Word with you today. It's kind of difficult to share messages like this when... I know that you've never heard uh, what I'm going to be sharing here and the way I'm going to be sharing it. So to give you kind of an idea, there was a lot of changes took place when Jesus was crucified and, you know, died and was buried and resurrected and exalted the fullness of God. Now, Jesus had a choice to die or not. Father didn't make him die. He, he had the choice. And that's one reason why uh, God was so pleased with Jesus is because that he made the choice to go all the way through all that suffering and, uh, and rejection and everything and the torment, you know, the death on the cross. And they arrested him illegally, tried him illegally, and, and he still went through all that without sin. And God was so pleased with him that he exalted him to the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, let's take a look real quick at what existed before Jesus now. There was God in the Old Testament and His Word. His Word, the living Word, Christ. Christ in the Old Testament, when uh, the power of God, it says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 24, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, His perfect spoken word, 
and his power of his word. Jesus, I mean, God spoke, let there be light, and the, the living word then, his word, went forth and created light. He spoke to Moses, and it says in Hebrews uh, 11.26, and Moses esteemed the riches of Christ. Moses esteemed the riches of God's spoken word to him greater than all the wealth of Egypt and left. See, Christ in the Old Testament throughout. But now, because of Jesus' death, you know, perfect walk of faith, the sacrifice for our sins and everything, and fulfilling all those requirements of the, you know, the sacrifices in the Old Testament, and his resurrection, God exalted him then into the fullness of God. So now it is God the Father, Jesus, and still Christ, his living word. So uh, God became a triune being when Jesus entered into the relationship that God and his word had in the Old Testament. Now, that is similar to the relationship in Egypt when the Pharaoh uh, was ruling Egypt by his word. And then when Joseph came along, if you look in now in about Genesis chapter 40 to 50, how uh, Joseph was sold into slavery and he was into jail and Pharaoh had some dreams and God gave him the interpretation of those dreams, gave uh, Joseph the interpretation of the dreams. And the Pharaoh was so pleased with it that uh, he exalted Joseph to the second highest position in Egypt. Joseph became the ruler of Egypt in a sense. The Pharaoh stepped back and let Joseph be the speaker and Joseph ruled by his word. See, now God has stepped back. He's exalted Jesus into the speaker position of the Trinity. It says in Hebrews chapter 1 that God speaks through his son today to us. And God then has stepped back. Jesus is the upfront speaker of his word, Christ, and he rules God's kingdom by his word, just like Joseph ruled the Pharaoh's kingdom by his word. The Pharaoh was still there. God is still here, but see, Jesus is the upfront speaker. God has honored him so much because of what he went through here on earth and, uh, and suffered and died and, and was resurrected and exalted to the fullness of Godhead bodily. Now, some people say that uh, Jesus was in the Old Testament at different times, like with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The, the, the uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the, the ruler, said, you know, I see four men. He said, uh, and one is likened to the Son of God. That didn't mean it was the Son of God. In uh, Psalms 34, 7, it says, the, let's see, uh, the angel of the Lord camps around about them that fear him and delivers them. You know what? Uh, the, we have the angel of the Lord with us too uh, all through the Old Testament like that God sent angels to perform his work but see it wasn't Jesus there it was an angel of the Lord so many times like that uh, in the Old Testament you know it's been taken that maybe Jesus was showing up but I'm going to read you some scriptures in just a few minutes to show you that in the Old Testament period it was only God and his living word Christ as a Godhead now, the Godhead is a Trinit Trinitarian or tri triune being, God, Jesus exalted man to God, and then Christ still the living word of either Jesus or God, which whoever you know, speaks at the time. Now, there was a great change there in the uh, relationship of God. Now, You've heard all through the scriptures where it says that God, he says he doesn't change in everything. And what he means by that is that he doesn't change in his uh, characteristics of, you know, caring for us, loving us, and, and things like this, and, and not lying, keeping his word to us and stuff. You know, he doesn't change like that. But he definitely changed because, well, he changed the covenant. And it says the Old, Old Testament covenant was faulty, and so he changed it to a new one. And uh, he changed for, well, let's see, Jonah and, and the people of Nineveh. When, when Jonah went and told him, you know, God told him, I'm going to destroy you in 40 days. They humbled themselves. They turned to the Lord with all their heart. 
and then God didn't do it. So he changed there. So so you've got to look at what does it mean when God says he never changes because he's changed a lot in the Old Testament. He changed for Nineveh and spared their lives because they turned to him. And, and he's changed many more times in different ways like that too. And he changes for us. We talk to the Lord in prayer and our prayers are important. He will change things because of our prayers. He'll change us, but he'll change circumstances too. Now, so you got to look at what it means when God says he won't change. He won't change in the fact that he, he doesn't lie. You know, he's, he's a total 100%. God is love. There is no love beside him. He is love. And he will never change from being loved. Now, what changed at the resurrection of Jesus on the day of Pentecost for us? Well, in the Old Testament, and as people are born today, in in this period of time, a baby is born without the Spirit of God in them. They have a body and they have a soul. And as a, a baby grows up, the baby then receives from the mother and dad and brothers and sisters and the, you know kindergarten and school and and television and things like this. They start receiving in their empty heart. See, their heart is empty without the spirit of God. They start receiving in their heart then these good things of the world and evil things of the world. It depends on how their family and their society raises them and everything. So, uh, a, a per person is born today body, a soul, which is the, the mind and emotions, and then an empty heart, no spirit of God in it. And we're all born alike with that empty heart, that desiring uh, God or something fulfillment, and we're incomplete without his spirit in us. But as he grows and as we grow and he teaches us that we're sinners, that Christ, that Jesus is the answer and that we must humble ourselves and turn to him, see, we must personally invite his spirit into our heart. And when we do then, we have a body, we have our mind and soul again, but now in our heart we have the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ, and it says in Romans 8 9, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. See, we're not a child of God until we receive his spirit in our heart. And that happens like prophesied in Ezekiel 36, 26, which says, A new heart also will give you, a new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh, give you heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit in you. And when he puts his spirit in us to live, the spirit of Christ in his living word in us, we become a child of God. We weren't a child of God before. We were his creation, body, soul, you know, mind and uh, emotions. But without his spirit in us, we're not, a child of God. Now, he loves us. He loved us with a perfect love. That's why Jesus died on us, so we could be changed. And now, when we invite God or Jesus to send his spirit into our heart, we receive his spirit in our heart, and that's what we call the work of grace. In the Old Testament, we had God's spirit to us, on us, which is mercy. Now, we've been changed by the spirit of God in us, changed by the work of grace into a triune being too, just like the, uh, God is a triune being with God, Jesus, exalted man, and his spoken word. We are a triune being now, body, soul, and spirit of God in us, the work of grace in us. And that happens all because of Jesus' resurrection and his suffering. And, and one of the scriptures I'll be reading in a few minutes said he saw beyond the cross. He saw how great it was going to be with God being a triune being and him in it. But he also saw us as a triune being with God in us too. We're now children of God. We're part of his family. We have eternal life. We will always be his children. And our eternal life started when the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, comes into our heart. But see, we have to invite him in. Now, I want to read you some of these scriptures here about Jesus being exalted to the fullness of Godhead bodily. And then I'm going to read you some scriptures in the Old Testament to show you that Jesus was not in the Old Testament, that that he was a, Jesus the man created here and then exalted to the fullness of the Godhead bodily. See, if, if he had, you know, so many ministers will say that Jesus left his throne in glory and he came down here and did all this. Well, 
if, if he was already God when he came down here, you know, he couldn't have been exalted anything. He was man. And I'll show you this from these scriptures. Now, let's see. Starting out first, though, even in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, it says, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. That was at the temple when he was about 12 years old that this uh, scripture was written here. So see, he wasn't uh, filled with the Spirit then. He wasn't, you know, God there, or he would have been uh, already in total favor with God and man. See, Jesus increased in wisdom, wisdom, God's pure word. Jesus increased in God's word and statue and in favor. If he had been filled with the Spirit here and uh, totally God, he couldn't have increased in any more favor with God. See? So from this scripture here, it shows that Jesus was born, yes, with the Spirit in him. He was born by the Spirit. God's Spirit it, uh, provided the conception you know, of Mary when the, the living word was spoken to her through the angel. When God's living word, she received it. That was the seed of God in her. She conceived and bore the son Jesus. Now, so... He grew into that because then in John chapter 1 verse 14, <coughs> excuse me, the word was made flesh and dwelled among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father. See, the only begotten of the father. We weren't begotten of the father like that. We were begotten by our earthly fathers, but the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth, full of grace. Grace is a work of God's spirit in our hearts. So he was... Uh, when he came into his ministry, he had the fullness of grace and truth. Now, truth, Jesus said in John 17, 17, when he was praying, sanctify them by thy word. Thy word is truth. So here, here, Jesus was full of the spirit of grace in his heart and full of God's word when he began his ministry at age 30. Now, but it says up there in Luke 2, 52 now that when he was age 12, he wasn't full, but he was growing in the grace of and that now in um, Galatians 3 16 says now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made he saith not and to seeds as of many but of one to thy seed which is Christ see Christ the living word of God is the seed of God therefore that living word the seed in Mary she conceived and in uh, she was told by the angel, thou shalt call his name Jesus. Okay, in Romans chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, or Jesus, the Apostle Paul and a lot of disciples would say Jesus Christ because in their day when they were writing those scriptures, Jesus and Christ were the same. But until Jesus was exalted, the full, fullness of the Godhead bodily, Jesus and Christ were not the same because Christ left Jesus right before he died on the cross and that's when uh, Jesus took on the sins of the world because sin is separation of the heart from God and you know like uh, babies are born with an empty heart no spirit of God see that's what it means to be born in total sin no spirit of God in us when we're born but then we have to come to that you know when Jesus when God brings us to the knowledge that we're a sinner we need Jesus as our answer to our sins and we must call out to him, see, then we have to make a knowledgeable personal choice to say, Lord, please forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and save me. I commit my life to you. See, we're born in total sin, total separation of our heart from God. But then we have to personally at some time invite him to come into our heart. Now, so Romans 1, 3, concerning his son Jesus, our Lord, which was made the seed of David according to the flesh, see. He was made according to the flesh. In John 3, 3, it says, Except a man be born again. Now, see, he had the Spirit of God in him all the time. Jesus didn't have to be born again because he was born in Mary's womb by the Spirit of God, the seed of, you know, Christ, his only begotten Son. Now, 1 Peter 1, 23 says, uh, Being born again for us now, since we weren't born like that, we had none of God's Spirit in us. Said, 
being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, the seed of God, which liveth and abideth forever. That's why we must be born again. Jesus didn't have to be born again. He was born right the first time, or he was born by his heavenly Father the first time. We're born by his heavenly Father when we humble ourselves and invite him to come into our heart. Acts 2, 31, 36. Peter says, And he, David, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Jesus, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. See, God was so pleased with Jesus, the man Jesus, for what he went through, that it says his flesh did not see corruption. Now, I don't know where it is today or something like that, but anyway, uh, we'll just keep going here. This Jesus has God raised up whereof we are all witnesses, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted. I have about uh, 25 or 30 scriptures from the Old Testament here. The right hand of God was the honored position of power and everything. Let me just read you one real quick. Psalm 60, verse 5. That thy beloved may be delivered, save with thy right hand. Hear me. See, there was salvation in the Old Testament from the right hand of God, you know, him, him taking care of them. Uh, Psalms 48.10 According to thy name, O God, so is the praise to the ends of the earth. Thy right hand is full of righteousness. Righteousness is acceptance and obedience to God's word, to faith and everything. Psalm 63.8 My soul follows hard after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me. He's our you know, strength, our provider, and everything like that in the Old Testament. But it was called the right hand of God, the position of power, you know, like that, for pleasures forevermore, for saving strength, for... For whatever a person needed, it was considered to be, you know, from the right hand. Even in Psalms 98, 1, it says, uh, victory at the right hand of God, his holy arm. But uh, here, in, uh, Peter is saying, therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, see, the position of power. And Jesus says, all power in heaven and earth were given to him when he was exalted after his resurrection. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus the man whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. He's our Lord, and he's the, the living word of God. But see, that happened after he was resurrected because of God you know, was just so pleased with him. Now, so Jesus then was exalted into the position, you know, of the upfront speaker, it says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, of the Trinity now, and God steps back and lets him rule the kingdom. When Joseph was exalted to the second highest position, now Jesus wasn't exalted to the second highest position now in the Godhead. He is fully God, and he is exalted to the fullness of the Godhead bodily. But Joseph was exalted to the second highest position as if he was the Pharaoh. But the Pharaoh stepped back, gave Joseph complete total rule in Egypt by his word. Jesus has complete total rule in God's kingdom by his word. Now, in the uh, Acts 5 again. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and savior for to give repentance to Israel, forgiveness of sin. See, God can only forgive sin. Jesus became exalted to God for forgiveness of our sins. And we are his witnesses. He's saying, so is the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey. Then in uh, Philippians 2, 5 through 11. I'll skip down to some of this. Got so much more to cover today. I may have to cover some more of it on Wednesday. But it says, uh, And being found in fashion as a man, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death of the cross. Wherefore God also highly exalted him, Jesus, and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, earth, things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord. It says here, Jesus Christ is Lord. But see, Christ has always been God. Christ, the living word in the Old Testament like that. So, but Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But today, after him being exalted in the fullness of Godhead bodily, saying Jesus Christ, they're one and the same now. 
but they weren't when Jesus was on the cross. He was man there dying for our sins when, G when Christ left him, and he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? See, it was a man Jesus in that took our sins and suffered for us. That's why God was so highly pleased with him and exalted him to the fullness of Godhead bodily. Jesus had never known a separation of his heart from God. Jesus had never had that separation, but he took the separation for us so that we will just leave our bodies and move through the Spirit to be with God and never be separated again from God either. Website at raharden.com that's the World Wide Web at R-A-H-A-R-D-I-N dot com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. The leader in talk radio on the internet, right here on K98talk.com. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. Past programs of God's Pure Word of Faith, go to www.spreaker.com. That's Spreaker. S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. In the search box at the top of the page, enter my name, Richard Harden, H-A-R-D-I-N, and click on it. A picture with a cross and God's pure word of faith, Richard Harden, will show up. Click on the picture of the cross. A listing of all the past programs will then show up. Richard Harden. Talk in the Spark Radio Network is proud to announce that our very own Rowdy Rick Robinson has been selected as one of the top conservative talk show hosts in the nation for his program, America Off the Rail. Again, congratulations to Rowdy Rick Robinson for a job well done and another reason to stay connected to K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord, right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. The leader in talk radio on the Internet, right here on K98talk.com. Now back to God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden. Welcome back to God's Pure Word of Faith. I want to continue to read some of these scriptures here to show you how Jesus the man was exalted to God. Jesus, uh, here let's see, I just finished reading in Philippians chapter 2 where it says, that God has exalted him, given him a name above every name, the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If you look in Isaiah, God states in Isaiah that uh, everybody's going to bow to him and confess that he's Lord. Now, see, he's, he's saying he's going to give that to Jesus. So, uh, uh, this proves that, you know, that that God has, you know, exalted him to the fullness of the Godhead. Okay, let's see. In uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says, 
it starts at uh, who being in the brightness of his glory and express image of his person upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sit down at the right hand of the majesty on high see in purging our sins that's when uh, God left him Christ left him on the cross and he says my God my God why hast thou forsaken me and then Jesus took the sins like the scapegoat you know in the Old Testament sacrifices they would put all the sins or pray all the sins onto the scapegoat and lead him out into the wilderness to take the sins away from the people well here Jesus took our sins the, the full you know separation of his heart from God the sin took it we don't have to go through that anymore now that we have Christ in our heart and uh, we're a child of God, when we die, this physical body just falls off and we just keep right on going. You know, uh, there, there is no separation of us from God. It says, but now, let's see, who is set on the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven, but hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, a meteor of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. See, he is the foundation of our better promises under the... Uh, New Testament covenant and everything. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 and 12 says, By which we will be sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. He you know, offered the perfect sacrifice for us. And uh, we don't have to do that. But this man Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. So Hebrews 12, 2 then says, Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for who by the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So he knew what was coming. He knew what was on the other side of the, the death and the resurrection of him going to be with his father. He knew what God had promised him everything. And he knew what was going to be on the other side of it for us. Because see, here we were, like in those days, the Old Testament people, they just had God's word to them and his, you know, uh, uh, favor and, and like this. The, they weren't, in a sense, children of God like we are. Now, they were called children of God. They were his God's people and everything. But when God puts his spirit in us today, we are joined with him and we're actually sons of God. And again, you know, Ezekiel says, you know, a new heart also will give you, a new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart I will give you heart of and put my spirit in you. See, that's when we become a child of God. And the people of the Old Testament didn't have that. Now, and so, uh, Let's see, in 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, For there is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Now, the Apostle Paul here was specific. He says the man Christ Jesus. He didn't just say Christ Jesus because he wanted you to know he's talking about the man Christ Jesus that died on the cross, who gave himself ransom for all to be testified in due time. Now, and then in Galatians 3.20, the Apostle Paul says, Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. See, he's saying that uh, he, Jesus was to be exalted to be our mediator, you know, between us and God. But but God was so pleased with him that he exalted him to the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And that's why Paul's saying here there's kind of a little difficulty here because a mediator is normally between two beings. But God is one, so Jesus, you know, really not a mediator day. He is God today, the fullness of God. Okay. Now, so, see, God was so pleased with him and what he did. And then in Acts 2.36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ, the living word. Lord, he's our Lord and living Christ. And wherefore God highly exalted him, uh, Jesus, and given him a name above every name, the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, things under earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If you haven't bowed in your heart, if you haven't bowed your knees, your being to the Lord, well then today is the day to do it. Today is salvation. Now, I want to read you some scriptures here now that it shows that it was a man Jesus we're talking about here. Look what the people of the Old Testament had now. Uh, because some people say that Jesus was in the Old Testament, but uh, the scriptures here say different. In Isaiah 59, 21, God says, This is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit is upon thee. Now see, his spirit on us is what's like mercy, a one-way love to us. His spirit coming to us 
but external to our heart. Like he protects us from having automobile wrecks. He protects us from this thing. We, you know, he, he helps us here and like this. His spirit working external to our heart is mercy. God's mercy to us. Like, if you want to read what mercy is, look up Luke 2, I mean Luke 10, 37, the story of the Good Samaritan, that one-way love the Samaritan had for that man hurt on the side of the road, took care of him and everything, didn't ask for anything in return, a one-way love to that hurt man. See, that's, that's God's mercy, mercy. And he wants us to show people mercy. Then uh, there's other examples of mercy in there. If you look in, uh, what is it? In Luke 6, 31 to 36, pray for those who despitefully use you, you know, help others, you know, uh, give to those in need, and be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful, it says. So see, these examples of mercy here show you that mercy is a one-way love, external to people. But now, grace is the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ coming into our heart. When He put His Spirit in us, you know, created a new heart and put His Spirit in us, and, and that work of his spirit in us then is what we call the work of grace and see we receive that from the resurrected spirit of Jesus Christ and uh, but the people of the Old Testament didn't have that let me continue that Psalms not Psalms excuse me Isaiah 59 21 as for me this is my covenant with them saith the Lord my spirit is upon thee my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart from thy mouth see they had in the Old Testament God's word. Jesus says, you know, uh, thy word is truth. So they had mercy and truth in the Old Testament. Psalms 25.10 go truth. God's word to them. To such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. Now see, to ungodly people back in those days, there was a lot of judgment and punishments and things like that. But he's talking about here, to anyone in the Old Testament or before the accepting, you know, uh, Jesus today as personal Lord and Savior, God's mercy, love is to the people and his word is to the people. Like he will teach us today, he'll, he'll teach a child about God. And, um, and about Jesus and about sin and things like this. But then, see, that's his love to the person. Um, and it says, you know, the grace of God that brings salvation appeared to all men. That is, his love has appeared, but everybody doesn't receive it. Second Thessalonians 2, 10, 11 says, the people perish because they reject the love of the truth. See, God is going to teach people their need for him in their heart, their need for salvation and everything. And that Jesus is the answer, the uh, Romans what is it, 623, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, see, and as he teaches people like that, then they have to respond and to invite Christ in into their heart, but here, like in the Old Testament, and before a person becomes a Christian, even in our day, all the paths of the Lord are mercy, God's love, like it said up here, his spirit upon thee, and truth, his word, now, Psalms 89, 14, Excuse me. It says, Justice and judgment are habitation of thy throne. See, God's throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. See, it's mercy, God's love to people, and God's word to people. There's no mention of Jesus there. Psalms 86, 15. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion, gracious, long-suffering, plenteous, plenteous in mercy and truth. See, it's just God's love to people. And his truth, his word to people. Psalms 98 3. He hath remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. See, that God was in the Old Testament, his love to people, and his truth, his word to people. Psalms 105. The Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endures to all generations. Psalms 108 4. For thy mercy is great above all the heavens. Thy truth reached to the clouds. See, in all of these, God was a two-part God or two-part being or whatever you want to call it in the Old Testament. It was his love to people and his word to people. Now, under the new covenant, Jesus has been exalted into the fullness of this. And now we have a triune God or a Trinitarian or a Trinity relationship of God the Father, Jesus exalted, the man Jesus exalted into the fullness of God, 
and Christ, the living word of either God or Jesus, whichever speaks, but God has backed off and given Jesus the upfront speaking relationship, like in the Old Testament, the Pharaoh backed off and gave Joseph the upfront speaking position. And there's only a couple of times that the Pharaoh spoke during that time of, um, he allowed Joseph to be the ruler. One time was when he ordered Joseph to go get his family and come live with them in Goshen. Now see, that's one thing about uh, the Trinity relationship here. God has not ordered Jesus yet to come get his family. See, we're the family of God. We're the lively stones, you might say, the family of God building his kingdom here on earth and the bride of Christ. And we're going to go to the, you know, the wedding supper, something like that. And and this is kind of like a picture of the rapture of calling us out of the world, coming in to be with him. It's going to happen someday. But see, uh, Jesus told the disciples and everything, no one knows, but only the Father knows when that's going to happen. The Father gives the order, you know, to send after the, you know, the, the, the son to go after his bride. And that hasn't happened yet. But it did in Joseph's day. The Pharaoh ordered him to go get his family and bring them home to live with them and everything. So in the Old Testament, the people only had God's word to them. And, well, God's love to them and his word to them. And his word was Christ because, like it said in Hebrews 11:26, uh, and Moses esteemed the riches of Christ, see, God's word, greater than all the wealth of Egypt. So Christ has been exalted to the right-hand position of power. He's given all power and authority. And he's given the position of speaker, it says in Hebrews uh, chapter 1, verse 1. And God has kind of stepped back to let Jesus rule the kingdom. The, uh, speaking of Christ here in 1 Corinthians 1, 24, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom, the pure word of God. And then in the Psalms 136, 5, it says, To him and by wisdom, see, the pure word of God, Christ, by wisdom he made the heavens. In Jeremiah 51, 15, it says, And he hath made the earth by his power. He has established the world by his wisdom. See, wisdom, the, the spoken living word of God in the Old Testament. God said, Let there be light. Christ, or his perfect wisdom, the spoken word of God, went forth. So Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And Proverbs 3.19, the Lord by wisdom founded the earth. See, by wisdom, by his living spoken word in those days, or his pure word. Psalm 33.6, the word of the Lord, uh, were the, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. See, by God's spoken living word, which is Christ, Christ, the, the power and wisdom of God throughout the ages. And, um, and, and that's why it says in, in Hebrews, uh, it says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now see, so often when the Apostle Paul and others, well, when they said Jesus Christ, or we say Jesus Christ today, they're one and the same because it was after the resurrection. But see, and that's when Paul met Jesus was after the resurrection. And, and I guess the term, the people were calling him Jesus Christ then. But see, there's a difference here. Uh, Jesus was God's exalted man. It said, uh, the word of the Lord were the heavens made by the word of the Lord. Now, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes, Christ was the same yesterday, today, and forever. God's living word, the creating universe, you know, power creating the universe. But see, Jesus hasn't been the same yesterday, today, and forever because Jesus was born at his walk of faith, left on the cross, when Christ left him, the man Jesus in died on the cross, and God was so pleased, he exalted in the fullness of God. See, Jesus has changed quite a bit. So that particular scripture, is where it says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday today, and forever, should be Christ the same yesterday today, and forever. Because you can see from these scriptures here about Christ, it says in uh, John 1, 3, and well, following John 1, 1, okay. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was God. Now, in verse 3, all things were made by Him. Now, who is it talking about here that created all things? The Word of God, the living Word of God. 
and without him was nothing made that was made. See, it's God's wisdom, his perfect word, his spoken word that created all things. So you, you've got to look at these scriptures and see, is the writer like the Apostle Paul, like one, in a couple of cases there, Paul said, the man, Jesus Christ. See, to be specific, he was talking about just Jesus. Well, he could have just said Jesus, but he said the man, Jesus Christ. So when you read through the scriptures like that, there's so many different things being taught back and forth. We need to try to get them clarified at uh, what they do mean. Proverbs 11:30, the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life. He that winneth souls is wise. So when he says everything was created by wisdom, wisdom, the Lord founded the earth, the word of the Lord, the heavens created the heavens and so on like this. What is... Uh, that to us. Well, in Proverbs 11:30, the fruit of the righteous tree of life, he that winneth souls is wise. If you want wisdom, if you want Christ, if you want him working with you, and that's why, like in the deliverance prayer a few weeks ago, I said, pick a lost person and start praying for them. Get concerned about the lost because, you know, uh, God is concerned about every lost person on this earth right now. Today is the day of salvation. He would like for everybody right now to turn to him, but he's not going to make them do it. But here... He that winneth souls is wise. Wisdom, God's pure word to you, God's, you know, uh, pure spoken word. Well, in probably the Proverbs uh, 30, 5 and 6, every word of God is pure. See, it's wisdom. Christ is pure. Every word of God is pure. A shield and put their trust in it. Add thou not to it, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. So if you want to be seeking to be closer to God's will in your life and what you're doing, start seeking to testify and share and reach out to lost people because that is the direction that God is going every day all around our world. He's reaching out to the lost. In Ezekiel 33, 11 it says that God does not rejoice in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and see he's doing everything he can and he wants us to go too. If you read that Luke chapter 6 I mentioned a while ago again about God's mercy he wants us to go to the lost he wants us to share with them he wants us to speak to them even though they don't do anything positive in return that we see and know of they may someday but in your life if you want to start getting um, in, more in favor with God or more in line with his will I know whatever he has for you is to reach out to lost people in some way to me too. The fruit of the righteous tree of life. How many trees of life do you have back in your past? People that you've witnessed to and shared with and they've turned their hearts and life to the Lord. He said, he that is wise win a soul. So and we need wisdom. See, wisdom is Christ, the living word of God. So we, we, we can't win a person's soul as in the way of putting it here. But we can share with them Christ, the living, pure word, and help them then want to see what they're missing and help them know that they need to turn to the Lord with all their heart. Because someday, as it said in the scriptures, every knee shall bow. And if a person doesn't bow in their heart to the Lord here on earth during this time of such great opportunity, especially in our nation with all the, so many different copies of the scriptures and Bibles, you know, to read and, and check out back and forth because some of them, you know, they say a lot of different things. So many, you know, opportunities we have to, you know, study using concordances and using the computer to research and everything like this. We, such an opportunity to have the freedom to study and seek the Lord with all our heart, but we're losing it. And the devil is coming against us in all different ways to try to take away that uh, freedom of religion that we've always had, you know, in my age, that is, in my time, had the freedom and everything. It's being changed. But now we got to each start seeking the wisdom of God, the word of God, the pure word of God that he will back up to share with people so that they can see what they're missing. That they have an empty heart full of, you know, lust and fears and just all kind of things like this. And that the Lord will take those. He'll erase those, create them a new heart, put his spirit of love in their heart. And, and we'll actually be then children of God. See, that's what the lost people in our society are missing. And that's what they're looking for. They're running around trying to get power and trying to get money and trying to get, you know, more sex or more drugs or more this or that to, to try to fulfill that emptiness in their heart. 
and God wants to be the filler of their heart. He wants to come into their heart and give them that peace and take away all those lusts and everything and fear and hate and everything to put his love in their heart and for them to become one of his children. See, uh, there's nobody born on this earth predestined to go to hell, and I'm going to share a message of that in, in one of these weeks here about Calvinism and about, you know, uh, election. Election is to service. Uh, and I can go right now in uh, what is Second Timothy one nine. This tells about election right here. Second Timothy one nine says he saved us and called us to a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace created in Christ Jesus before the world began. That service he's created everybody to a special special calling of service. See, he just he, you know, he didn't have to elect people to come to salvation. Everybody he's, you know, allowed to be created here on earth, he wants them to come to him. You know, he doesn't hate anybody and predestine anybody to hell, and they can't. Uh, and I'm going to show you in black and white in the scripture that it just shows it so clearly like that. And that's going to be one of my messages coming up soon. But right now, though, if you're listening today and you haven't received the Spirit of Christ in your heart, you are living with such terrible. Um, pain and suffering and confusion and things like that in your heart and you think well that's just normal well it is normal for a person without Christ but when the spirit of Christ God's love comes into your heart creates in you the new heart new life at salvation um, and it's so easy to do uh, if we just confess our sins if we confess that to the Lord our need and our desire and everything say Lord please forgive me my sin come into my heart and save me and 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And, the, and when He does that, then it's, it's because we call out to Him and invite Him and ask Him to. Galatians 4 6 and 7 says, Now speaking to Christians, because your sons, see, He says, Now why your sons? He says, Because your sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, or Daddy, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then heir of God through Christ. See, no more servant but a son. That's the instant we become a child of God is when he puts his spirit, the spirit of his son, Christ, into our heart, the living word into our heart. Romans uh, 8 9 says, Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. That's the dividing point. When you humble yourself and you turn to him. And when you call out to him with all your heart, what is Jeremiah 29, 13 and Deuteronomy uh, 6, it says, and you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. So it's got to be a wholehearted, honest commitment and, uh, and say, Lord, just please help me. You know, that, that's all you really got to say if it's from your heart, because in 2 Corinthians three sixteen it says, when the heart of man turns to the Lord, the veil of separation is lifted. What it means by that veil in the Old Testament, there was a veil between the Holy of Holies and only the priest could go in once a year. And he had to be you know, cleansed of his sin to go in because nothing could go in there with sin. So he had to be cleansed of it and forgiven of it before he could go in. Well, and, and that's the way it was all during the Old Testament. Only the priest once a year and the other people couldn't because they were sinful. Well, when the heart turns to the Lord, the veil of separation is lifted. See, God removes that veil, that separation between us and Him. And He then comes to live in our heart. And our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God lives in us and in our heart. See, that is the covenant today. And that is so great. Such a change in everything. And again, Ezekiel 36, 26, that change takes place. A new heart also will give you. A new spirit will I put within you. See, I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh. A stony heart with all those lusts and with all that hate and with all that different stuff in your heart that you've been taught by people of the world and everything and TVs and, and all this. He said, I'll give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you. See, and that's when we become a child of God. And if you're listening today, it just takes a simple, honest prayer. And that's what it means in John 3, 7, where Jesus says, You must be born again. You was born of your earthly fathers. Now you must turn to the Lord and be born of his spirit into your heart. The seed of God, the seed of God, the Christ, the living word. 
And in Romans 10, 13, it says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that name is Jesus. Pray along with me now a simple, honest prayer, repenting, wanting to turn from your sin. Jesus, I ask you to please forgive me and cleanse me of all my sins. I want to turn from my sins. I surrender my heart and life to you and invite your spirit, Christ, the living word, to create in me the new heart and live in my heart. In your name, Jesus, I ask. Amen. If you just pray along with me, or if you pray along now, just the best you can with all your heart to the Lord. It doesn't have to be exact words, because God hears heart language. And just your heart desiring, Lord, help. Come into me, and I give you my heart and life. Send me an email. Go to my website. and on, it, There's a book tab up top of my website. that um, You can go to it, and there's a email there. Send me I had to remove some of the uh, ads out of the end of the program here. They were dated and were out of date. So I'm going to uh, include a short message here on overcoming fear. And you know, as Christians, we have a new heart from God and the Spirit of Christ, God's power in us. God is love and His Spirit is in our hearts. In John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, it says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love, God, casts out fear, because fear is torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love or God yet. So in James 4, 7, the scripture says, Submit therefore to God, or his spirit in you. Resist the devil, fear, and he, the devil in fear, will flee from you. When you start getting apprehensive about something, like starting to fly or a storm coming, looking ahead at what might happen to you in your job, your health. Don't just worry and think about these future events or maybe something that you're even going through right now. Philippians 4, 6 says, When you start getting anxious, turn to God then by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God. Your request and your concern to be known to God. Worrying won't help you one bit, but it will cause you to miss God's blessings to you during that time. So, choose, make the choice yourself to set yourself in submission to God in prayer, talking to God, and counting your blessings from past things, experiences with God. Then watch the devil and fear flee from you. Now, always let your anxiety be a red flag to remind you to pray. God loves you. He will hear you. And in First Colossians one twenty seven, Christ in us, our hope of glory. So have a good day. God bless you. And be set free. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord. Right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. Dot com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. For past programs of God's Pure Word of Faith, go to www.spreaker.com. That's Spreaker. S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. In the search box at the top of the page, enter my name, Richard Harden, H-A-R-D-I-N, and click on it. A picture with a cross and God's pure word of faith, Richard Harden, will show up. Click on the picture of the cross. A listing of all the past programs will then show up. 
The staff of K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network is proud to announce that our very own Rowdy Rick Robinson has been selected as one of the top conservative talk show hosts in the nation for his program, America Off the Rails. Again, congratulations to Rowdy Rick Robinson for a job well done and another reason to stay connected to K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network.